Okay, we're off to a technology glitch start, as used to be expected, because this is Harvey Mudd. I, we teach technology, but nothing here works. So uh, I emailed the CIS this morning, the help desk, and said, I was in here yesterday, and the portable mic does not work. I got a big class at 245. Please make sure it's working by 245. And they said, oh, there'll be somebody there to help you set it up. I don't need help setting it up. I just need it to work. So as you can see, no one's here, which is a typical response I get from CIS. And I called their number, and they told me what their hours of operation are, which is between 8.30 and 5. <laughs> Maybe they mean 8.30 p.m. and 5 a.m. I don't know, but nobody's there at the phone. So thanks to the uh, bumbling bureaucracy of Harvey Mudd, we have to, uh, I have to give you a lecture holding up a microphone in front of my face for at least one day. The email that they'll get this afternoon will be impolite, unlike the phone call that I made this morning. Um, okay, so here we have a lot of, uh, I gotta <laughs> I could actually do this without a mic, I think, but you may have trouble hearing me in the back. Um, so the problem that you see here, which is um, we have more people in this class than came to convocation yesterday, is um, the uh, going to go away as a problem because most of you know, but not all of you, that this class is streamed online to YouTube and it's being streamed right now. That was glitchy also at work yesterday, but at least I got that fixed. So you're not required to come to class. You can watch the stream back in your dorm, and of course the stream is archived after the stream, and you can watch the archive if you want. So when we meet on um, Tuesday, then there'll probably be about 35 people in here instead of 220, because most of you will choose to use the streaming option gives you a lot more personal freedom and allows you to um, look at the lecture whenever you want. So all of this crowd will only be a problem on today and exam days. <laughs> we'll have to figure out what to do about exam days because this is a little intense for examination. So don't worry about the crowding. Um, let's talk some about the course. So you'll know what I expect of you and what's involved in all of this. And so uh, you can find me up in Parsons 1261. And that's my email address right there. And I do have office hours on Wednesday and Thursday between 1 and 2.30. But I get here pretty early in the morning so I can get the prime parking spot. And I don't leave until 4 or 5. So I'm here almost every day. And you can just walk over and find me at most times. And I'm usually able to drop whatever I'm doing and talk to a student unless I'm really under the gun or something. Um, 
I have a Twitter account that I deactivated for a while that I haven't reactivated, but I will sometime uh, later this week or next week. I don't like social media in general, so I shut it off and I'm not using it for class purposes, but um, I often post a lot of topical issues that pertain to subjects we talk about in this class on Twitter, and so uh, I'll turn it back on so that I can do that again for Econ 104. It's not anything that you need to know or you'll be graded on, but a lot of students um, care to know what I think about current events as they proceed. And sometimes I can work that into the lecture, but a lot of times I don't have uh, the time to do that. So I'll talk a little bit about my qualifications to teach this class more as we go along, because I'll talk about some of the software I use and, and, uh, and what I do at a professional level. Uh, by example, when we come to a certain subject like options, I'll show you some of my options trading models. But um, I have a PhD in economics, not finance, but I have uh, a master's degree that's essentially in finance. And uh, my background is in financial economics, and then I'm a very heavy and active trader in most markets. I trade every day. I'm an algo trader. I have computer programs that trade on my behalf and that sort of thing. And I teach that in Econ 136, uh, for example. So. I know a great deal about this stuff, and then of course I wrote the book that I'm allowing you to use for free on finance. I'll say a little bit more about that when it comes to the point in the lecture that it's time to talk about it. And you can find all of the course materials that I use um, for all my classes actually under that link right there. And then once you get to that link, then you can go to the specific course and the specific page for the specific course. And, you can find everything you need. I don't use Sakai for the same reason that I'm going to set up my own microphone the next time we come to class. I have to have complete 100% reliability on the technology that I use, and that's impossible to achieve it much. So that's why all this stuff is mine. Uh, I could review this lecture or do this lecture in media site like I used to for two or three years because we have those very expensive cameras back there that could capture this. And we pay $50,000 a year to MediaSite to allow a lecture capture of lectures, although they charge about $5,000 a year to archive those lectures if you want to archive them for, you know, past the semester and the like. And so, but the system wasn't 100% reliable. Some days it just wouldn't work. And so the YouTube setup we have here costs about $400 to set up, and 300 of that is for the Experian XP little box I have right there that actually runs an Android, believe it or not, and uh, it's free, right? Uh, they don't charge $50,000 a year, they don't charge anything. And if I want to archive it, then they don't charge anything for that either. So uh, it makes a lot more sense to run our own stuff here than to rely upon um, the stuff that's bought by the school. So I don't use Sakai because of its, um, partly because of its limits on what you can download and, and the like. I have my own servers to do all this stuff. So I'm going to talk a lot about the course today and how we're going to proceed, what we're going to do, um, and what I'm going to expect of you. And by the end of the day, you should fully understand all of that. And then when we come back on Tuesday, we'll really hit the decks and start moving through the material. Now, as I point out in the course outline, if you haven't read that, uh, it's linked off this, uh, I'm pointing here and you can't see what I'm pointing at, it's linked off that palmislandtraders.com thing. I explain all of this, so you can go back and read it, and I point out to you that this course is not difficult in the sense that we have high theory that you just can't quite figure out how it works, but the course is difficult in the density of the material that I have. There is an awful lot of stuff that I throw at you, and so basically you can do well and get your A uh, if you simply keep yourself organized to be reviewing it in a timely way as it's given to you. If, if you can organize yourself in such a way that you can do that, and don't let the temptation of never having to come to class throw you too far behind, and some of you will have that problem, then you can keep it organized and you can get a very good grade in this course and learn a lot without putting a lot of time and effort into it. So uh, that's, how I'm how, that's how it's designed to be set up. And students in the years past have liked that. Now I think the enrollment in this class is normally about 140. And so the reason we hit 220 this year is possibly this is the last time the course will be taught because I'm at retirement age now and haven't quite decided exactly what I'm going to do about next year, but I'm not likely to come back and this therefore would be the last time this course is taught. 
And unfortunately, I don't think they plan to hire anyone who has a background in finance to replace me. So not even an incompetent version of this course is going to be taught next year. <laughs> no version of it is going to be taught. So, um, so I think that enough of you have heard that rumor uh, to explain why we have uh, high enrollment this time around. There is a possibility. I'm trying to hold out. I told the college if they would buy me one of the new electric Bentley Bentegas uh, and just give it to me, that I'll come back for two years. And it would be... Um, I don't know if you saw it today, but the new all-electric Porsche Take Hand came out today, right? 761 horsepower, <laughs> all-electric, four-wheel drive, all-electric, with two, two electric motors, one on the front, one on the back, and um, capable of 0 to 60 2.6, which is actually still beatable by a Tesla Grand X that's in ludicrous mode, but the Tesla Grand X can't go around a corner like the Porsche can, right? So... Performance is more than just acceleration for an eighth of a mile. So, so if the college will uh, agree to give me, I might settle for a new Audi e-tron to, uh, the, to replace my Q5 I have out there in the parking lot. And so if we can come to a deal like that, I may be, I may be teaching here for years to come. But if, we, but if we can't or don't, then I have to go out and figure another way to get my Bentega. That's basically what this boils down to. And so that's, uh, that's what this course size is all about, I think, if you hadn't figured that all already. Okay, let's talk about uh, why I think this course might be good for you and what my objectives are in, in teaching it. Now, one of the reasons that I really emphasize this course and its importance, and I tailor the content is uh, literally for your personal financial preparation after you graduate and get that high paying job that most of you are going to get. Uh, the, we'll talk quite a bit about this 1% versus 99% stuff, and, or the 10% versus 90 depends on whose perspective it is. And all of the wealth goes to a very tiny portion of the population, which generally is true. And it's mostly knowledge-based that that's true. Only a small percentage of the population knows how to build their wealth sufficiently to command all of it. And this course is kind of about that. It's about protecting your income and wealth um, over your lifetime, especially after you get married. And believe it or not, most of you will be married uh, by the time you're 30. And most of those who are married by the time you're 30 will have children. And therefore, the security of your family and income of your family and the security and safety of your children will matter to you perhaps more than it does now. Well, unless you're a very abstract thinker, considerably more than it does now since you have no children. Um, and so this is to some extent about uh, uh, helping them. And the approach, therefore, that I give is actually not, not only long term, it is literally intergenerational where I talk about how families preserve wealth over generations with that kind of emphasis, you know. And so um, there's a huge dose of that, as you're going to see. And I'll talk more about that today by talking specifically about what I mean by that, by example. And uh, we'll talk also more about it as the course proceeds. I'll keep bringing the subject up. Some of you will go to work in finance directly because it's the highest paying of the job categories that come out of this college by quite a stretch. Uh, many of the Harvey Mudders that start for the big quant trading firms when they graduate start with salaries above $250,000 a year. And so some of you are going to be interested in that. I get calls every year about this time from Headlands Technology, and they say, uh, give me your best students. We'll take a look at them and interview them because we need some more. Quant traders, and so of course this course is set up to begin the preparation for you at an undergraduate level to understand the markets for which they're hiring. And so there's that. The Econ 136 class, which is the modeling class, is really the orientation toward that, more so than this. This is more uh, directed at the personal financial preparation, but you can't talk in a job interview about trading put and call options unless you know what put and call options are. And so you'll learn that in this class. And we can't talk about what the futures market is currently telling us about the impact of Brexit unless you know what the futures market is and how 
uh, you measure the uh, future values of the pound to the dollar exchange rate, for example, and why that's affected by Brexit talks. So we cover all those things to just educate you generally in a financial world where knowledge is really wealth and power more than maybe any other area in which a person might study. Now, more specifically, I'm going to give you a very, very extensive overview of the finance markets. Talk about everything in this class. Um, as I said, not just stocks, we'll start with that, and mutual funds and ETFs, which is something anyone should know about, or just ordinary bonds like United States Treasury Securities. We'll also talk about some of the derivatives markets like put and call options, finance uh, futures markets, as I just pointed out a minute ago, and of course, real estate, and that odd, simple, but really important to understand market and the like. And we'll uh, look at it historically, we'll look at it pragmatically, we'll look at it even in terms of jargon. A lot of the examination is sort of like being a beginning first year medical student. You have to learn what the name of every little bone <laughs> is in your elbow. So uh, in this class, we kind of do the financial equivalent of what every little bone is in a United States Treasury bill, I guess. So um, it'll give you the language to some extent of finance. It's also tied to entrepreneurship. I teach the course in entrepreneurship, too. I'm teaching that on um, Monday and Wednesday, right? No. Oh, no, no, I'm teaching on Tuesday and Tuesday. This is Monday and Wednesday. And uh, finance is intricately wound up with entrepreneurship, obviously. As I was telling my opening class there yesterday, you can't do anything or go very far in this world unless you... Um, understand finance because you're going to need to raise money for your enterprise. You may in fact need to raise millions of dollars because these grand dreams you have about making your technology work tend to be very labor intensive at the development stage and so you have to hire coders and the like and you have to hire lawyers to fend off the efforts to steal your efforts and to penetrate your market and the like and the cost of that just adds up very quickly and so you're surprised to understand for even a fairly modest technology, you may have to raise a half million to say two million dollars just to get off the ground. So again, you need to know a little bit about the finance markets to understand how important that is and, and uh, what that world's all about. And because your mothers, you love theory and you like abstract thinking and, and the like, there's a lot of that in finance. And so I give some of that to you here uh, more of that, though, comes in the modeling class, the course that's the extension of this one, Econ 136. It's pure theory, but this gives you the background to take and understand that class, but we get some theory content in here, and mutters just tend to like that. I think you like abstract reasoning and, you know, reasoning through cause and effect or influence or whatever you want to call it. You like putting uh, some of this in the form of models and the like. But again, going back to the very top, the primary objective of this class is this sort of sense of intergenerational stability and in what is inherently, especially financially, a relatively unstable world. Now, to make that point so it's not abstract, let's get right to the 1%, 100%, 99%, 99% or whatever issue that is to some extent dominating American politics. These discussions of the separation of wealth and income started surfacing about five years ago. And of course, they'll be at full steam by the time we get underway for the 2020 election. These subjects will be substantial subjects uh, that will be discussed, especially even within the Democratic Party among the various candidates, because it's currently kind of split between progressives like uh, uh, Warren, and Sanders and uh, more traditional Democrats like Joe Biden. And so this discussion of income distribution or who are we trying to help out there or why are we using the losing the labor vote and all of that will be relentlessly combed over as this election comes. And it's because it actually is important. It's not fictional. It really matters a lot. It's really true that the vast bulk of wealth creation in this country globally actually, but in this country especially, goes to a relatively small percentage of the population. So if you say, let's not talk so much about the 1% as the 
uh, then probably 10% of the population will get about 80% of the wealth creation this year. And that's been true for a long time. It's relevant to you because, believe it or not, you're going to be in the 10% right at graduation. You'll be in the 10% among your cohort, that is, people your age, not people that are in colleges like Harvey Mudd, but among your age right off the bat. And you're actually pretty close to the 10% when you compare yourself actually against the overall American population your starting salaries are so high. So uh, to some extent, bizarrely, this is a defensive class, right? So instead of, you know, how can I grab some of that? Um, this is uh, maybe a class about how I can help others who don't have access to it grab some of that. But it's not going to be about how you can grab it. It's going to come to you almost automatically in the form of income. And then it will accrue to you also if and only un, uh, if you understand about finance in the terms of wealth. And that's what, basically what this class is about. So is, they treat this, well, the discussion of why there's this split in income and wealth is, of course, very emotional and very accusatory. And when it's conducted as a partisan discussion, it's almost not worth listening to because partisan politics in the United States is simply boiled down to effectively a football game. The point of your party is to simply win. It doesn't matter how you win. It doesn't matter whether your argument's legitimate or not legitimate. It just matters that you win. And so if that's the goal of the, uh, the partisan war, then, of course, the truth and um, a sense of well-thought consideration of the issues involved are not likely to surface very often, of course. And so when you take a look, though, at why this we have this split, it's actually very easy to explain. And once it's explained to you, you're going to realize, wow, that is not going to be easy to change. That's probably impossible to change. It's going to be so difficult. So let's take a look at it. Is this a big, mysterious question, um, is this due to class conflict? Maybe to some extent it is. Or is it due to something actually that's relatively simple, that's pretty easy to explain? And it turns out, as far as I'm concerned, that it's mostly the latter. Do you, uh, do you want to know why 80% gets um, uh, only 10% of the gains in wealth? Uh, do you think it's because of George Bush or Donald Trump? or Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton, or immigrants, or not immigrants, or China, or free trade, or evil China, or Vietnam. Um, some, all of that matters a little bit, but not much of it matters very much. And so the question is, well, actually, before we get into this, if you want to discuss it politically, who do you want to scapegoat? So let's get that out of the way, because that's the way the conversation is normally conducted in a political realm. Which group that you're not in do you want to blame for this problem, right? So make up your mind what that is, and then we can push that out of the way and get down to a explanation of this that doesn't have that as part of the discussion, because that doesn't have much to do with it. Uh, what sort of massively inappropriate measure do you want to take to fix this, for example? Uh, because we'll get a an offering of a large number of massively inappropriate measures to fix this, in the presidential campaign. That, that's why, by the way, uh, I'm a more moderate voter these days, probably leaning a little bit toward ancient Joe rather than, uh, <laughs> rather than uh, Sanders, because uh, I, I, I believe what people say that he's more likely to beat Donald Trump, uh, and obviously I'm not a Trump supporter. Uh, but also, I'm a little frightened at the extremities of some of the proposals being offered by the progressive left. Uh, and so what do you want to do to fix this or actually make it much worse? Well, here's the secret for you, all right? Uh, you take your money, whatever you have, whatever you can spare, whatever you can get your hands on, or whatever you can borrow from someone, and you buy stocks for capital gains and dividends, you buy bonds for capital gains, and you buy real estate for leverage. And when you do that, you will enter that club that is referred to as the 10%. And you will statistically show up as a member of that cohort 
rising through it probably for the rest of your life. And if you don't do that, you won't, unless you inherit money or get a little lucky and win the lottery or one other channel that I talk about in my other class are a successful entrepreneur because that, of course, is a very quick path to this kind of thing if you succeed in entrepreneurship, as you all know, right? So I don't, I don't talk about that in this class. I talk about that in entrepreneurship. And in fact, we don't talk much about that subject per se. That, in that class is about you know, how you build a company, no matter what your goal is for building it. So it's not about the goal, it's about the technique. But in this class, uh, it really is as simple as that, when you want to explain why uh, so much of the wealth accrues to such a small part of the population. Now, fortunately for you, the starting point obviously makes it very easy for you compared to those in your age cohort that didn't go to college or went to a college and didn't get the best of degrees, right? Because this is a great way to start when you're 21 years of age. So if you get one of these jobs that pays all of this, the median um, mean salary was, uh, what does it say there? $92,717. That's ridiculous, actually. You're being way overpaid, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's an acute labor shortage for people of the kind of skills that you're developing. And so there's a sense in which you actually do bring that kind of value to the company, or otherwise they wouldn't hire you. So you're not being overpaid in that sense. From a historical sort of, uh, let's talk sensibly about, you know, how we divide up the our nation's output, <laughs> from that point of view, you're being overpaid because it means you're losing everybody else in the dust. As soon as you graduate from here, you realize that if you have a high school friend that went to one of the Cal States and got a business degree, their starting salary is going to be about 35 or so, you know, one third of what you're making. And so certainly you're smart enough to understand that you can take a considerable part of that obvious surplus and start socking it away in the name of rising up through the ranks. And that's why enough people do that, that the wealth largely accrues to that cohort. That cohort and the entrepreneurial cohort that succeeds. So, um, so you saw this. Now, let's take a look at statistics. Let's take a look at a statistic view of this. And we say, well, how you define wealth and wealth is defined by an economist, especially at the national or aggregate level, as the delta in the ownership of monetized assets of some kind, right? You say, okay, in 2017, what is the value of this list of assets? In 2018, what is the value of the same list of assets? What is the delta? And that is what we refer to as wealth growth because wealth is the monetized value of these lists of assets for the largest part, when you look at this as a statistical point of view. And so we say, okay, in 2019, uh, the first quarter, the total level of assets that will manage by households, and so there's different ways we can look at this. One of these is to look at it at a personal level, but sometimes it's a little more advantageous to look at it at a household level because then you can use tax data that is broken down only by household level in more nuanced studies than what I'm talking about right here. So if you live by yourself because you're only 21, you're a household. But if you're 35 and you're married and you have two kids, that's a household, right? So we're looking at this from the standpoint of uh, household information. So. Total household assets in the United States earlier in this year, the most recent data for which um, there's information, was an astonishing $113 trillion. That's how much we control at the household level in the United States. Financial assets constituted 81.73 uh, trillion of that. When we break and disaggregate that down, bank and money market mutual fund deposits like your bank account and your time account and your savings account from that 81 trillion comes to about a little under um, a little about 12 and a half trillion and that's 11% of the total 
in that group, by the way, the percentage change is, oh, that's the percentage change of the category. Now, that doesn't grow as wealth grows so much, so we don't count that in the candidate of the kind of wealth management that's going to matter for you. But you know perfectly well that bonds, notes, and bills, which is to say interest-bearing financial assets, do matter because they rise in value, and those are markets where you buy and sell them, and those markets matter. Those constituted about $5.3 trillion. This is more important in the corporate arena than it is the household arena, but it's not unimportant. And it actually is more important than its proportion because it's the area to which we flee to avoid risk from time to time, and that's why bonds will really matter for us. But they amount to only about 5%. But when you take a look at stocks and mutual funds, um, that's $21 trillion right there, and that constitutes more than a quarter of the category of liquid financial assets that you can grow for wealth. So that's a big category. Then you have pension entitlements, which are falling in value because we are systematically attempting in the United States to destroy pension plans and replace them with 401ks and the like because those cost less for corporations to manage. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why uh, the general middle class that does not invest sees their wealth declining historically because at least they had pension funds to fall back on that in some cases were sizable if they were unionized. But we've spent the last 30 or so years in the United States breaking up unions and trying to destroy the organized labor movement. That's been largely successful. And with that has been the decline in the relative importance of pension plans. And the only remaining place where they're strong is in government employment. So if you go to work uh, for a technology company, they're not going to give you a pension. Nobody does that anymore. You would have received one had you gone to work in the 1980s, but not any longer. You'll be offered a 401k, which means you'll be investing in one of these other categories up there that I have highlighted in green. So pension entitlements will keep the middle class going, but they're falling in relative importance, and they're not something you can grow. They're just there. Um, there's a, other, then there's a non-financial assets, which comes to another $31 trillion. And the bulk of that is, of course, real estate at $25 trillion, representing 82% um, of its own category and about 23% of total wealth. And so what we're saying is that over time, given that wealth is defined to be the, uh, the I mean, the growth of wealth is defined to be the delta in these categories of assets, it shouldn't be too mysterious about why about 70 or 80 percent of the gain from this goes to a relatively small percentage of the population because that's the percentage of the population that makes well-managed and seriously considered investments in these major categories. It really is as simple as that, especially in a country like the United States. So if your income is so low, you never get to even get started in this stuff then your wealth is never going to grow very much. If your income is high, but you're so disorganized that you don't properly invest in this, your wealth isn't going to grow either. But if you start out with a relatively high source of income, you might inherit that, or you might get some family wealth, as a lot of you will do, and you manage that wisely, then you're part of the story of uh, politicians sort of regard as uh, one of the unhealthiest tendencies in American culture. And it is, actually. I'm not apologizing for it. I don't really, I just look at it and figure out how it works and tell you. And you can make of it what you will. And you can make of it, you know, what has to be done politically to change it if you think that should happen. For the largest part, let's get to the point of what it's really all about before you do that. And it really is for the largest part about all of this. Now, college, believe it or not, still does matter. Uh, I know you know that this sort of college, getting a STEM education, obviously matters. I just showed you the starting salaries. This college has the reputation, probably deserved, as the highest return on investment of any college in the world. You know, So that's good, I guess, uh, if you're looking at uh, things from this perspective. 
But even uh, degrees that aren't so valuable still matter more than not having one. And despite rumors to the contrary, you can see this here. Uh, this is from the U.S. Census Bureau studies, and so this just released not uh, six months ago or so. And you can see that the premium of college over high school, the premium being the blue line, is substantial. And this just averages it all out, right? It doesn't take account in what the major is, and so this is, you know, high-paying majors, low-paying majors, and so forth. Uh, you say the premium is absolutely massive, actually. It starts out at like $25,000 a year, and of course it accumulates over time, right? It's every single year that spread is there, or some sizable spread, at least in percentage terms, is there. It never goes away. And so that the cohort that is represented by the upper line is able to, as part of their education, learn how to do this and then sock away a considerable part of that spread explains why at the end of 40 years or so, they have accumulated four, five, six, ten million dollars in assets, and the cohort that's represented by the bottom line has very little at all, maybe a hundred thousand dollars if that. That's the enduring story. That's really the way it works. Now there are, you know, sideshow parts of these stories where you find these exceptions. If you're a sports figure, uh, if you are a recording artist, then you know perfectly well that all of a sudden you make tons of money really fast if you're popular, obviously, and uh, you can uh, even get tattoos and make money. In fact, uh, there's actually a positive correlation between certain professions getting a tattoo and making money. Engineering is not one of them, but, uh, <laughs> but there are professions where it is. And so, uh, but you realize here we're kind of looking at the big picture and not the exceptions. And again, as I keep pointing out, the entrepreneurial route, which many mutters have followed, is if you succeed, and that's a big if, is obviously a direct connection to being in the one-tenth of one percent, not one percent. So I, I visit all the time mutters that, uh, from the 70s and 80s and even the last 10 years or so, uh, who have a net worth of well in excess of $100 million. And uh, that puts them, of course, as I say, in the one-tenth of 1%, one and they got there by building a company and selling it to somebody in every single case, right? So there's that channel as well. In most cases, they were not motivated by the wealth or income to do that. They appreciate the wealth and income, and they spend it, that's for sure. But that wasn't their motivation. Uh, I you know, I knew them when they were students here. They were, they were kind of into making the technology work and doing something, you know, that they could control and, you know, something really risky and all that. And it panned out for them. And one of the byproducts of that in the tech world is you incidentally get rich if that happens, and whether you want to or not. And so they are. And it's not as though that they're just turning their back on the wealth, though. They collect homes <laughs> in Malibu, <laughs> things like that, and buy jets, and uh, maybe one of them, will, I'll, I'll appeal to one of them, and I'll say, look, uh, if, you really, if you really have a soft place in your heart for future mud students, if you buy me a Bentley, then I'll stay there and teach them what I taught you. <laughs> I'm not saying, by the way, that uh, they got their rich because of wealth because of anything I taught them. Although Josh Jones frequently says the Econ 104 class, this class, is what enabled him to really grow his wealth after he sold DreamHost when he sold it, right? He tells people that. He said, I knew what to do with the money I made because of Evan's class. He says that all the time. Okay, let's take a look at the course then. So now you know that we're going to try to... Uh, do the socially inappropriate push you into the upper 10%. That's not what we're doing. It's just, we're talking about the facts of the matter, right? So you can, you can spurn all of this if you want. You can give your money away. You can invest it stupidly if you care to uh, and not make money. <laughs> so you're not being required to do that. But you know the course itself. I don't think I'll take the risk of deviating here to the course outline like I sometimes do. But if you haven't seen the course material, like I say, I don't use Sakai, so it's all on my own server, uh, which has never gone down once. In, in the, in the, well, it's backed up. It's like into all the uh, DNS routed to SiteLock and all that stuff, so it's stable. 
um, it's here. And again, I want you to mostly between now and the next time we get together, take a look at the, the course calendar where I have it set up in modules. And that's what this page looks like. So I want you to look at that. I want you to see what we've got there. You'll see I have everything all laid out. And I tell you what I want to read or want you to read and when the exams are and all of that. And we'll follow that really carefully. This course is very organized. And so if I say we'll be talking our opening lectures on options on October the 19th, that's the day it's going to be. And all of the exams, of course, are scheduled as such. So take a look at this. Now, I've got a kind of a survey here of where we're going um, that you will see when you look at that. First of all, we start with stocks. Module one is going to be about stocks. And this is area where a lot of you know the most fundamental information. You're a lot of you know what stocks are and all that and how they work. Some of you have trading accounts. So some of this material will be uh, something you already know. Although I go very deeply even on that. I mean, you really know if you trade stocks how a limit order book works, uh, like um, NASDAQ Total View. You know, you know how that works, for example. And, you need to know it, and or will need to know it by the time we get to the exam. And so we start sort of generally, we get very specific. We would start talking about the indexes, uh, like the S&P 500 and the Dow and what they are. And you'll notice that I'm giving you two chapters to read right away, chapter one and chapter two out of the free online book. And they're about these things. So you want to get started on that. And I have... Uh, the book, well, let me, I'll talk about the book later, but the book is there right now, so you, um, I'll talk about the book's design later. So you, uh, you want to get started on that, and you want to kind of stay up with me on the reading, even if you're kind of lagging a little bit on these lectures, you want to stay up with me on the reading. And then, I got to, okay, then we, uh, module two is, Module one is just what are they? What are, what are the structure of them? Uh, what are the institutions? And then we start talking about performance because obviously that's what matters. Uh, why is it some go up and some don't? <laughs> How do you figure out which ones those are going to be? Or what should your sort of generic investment philosophy be? And I'll give you um, a statement about performance that is quite practical for a student to follow with regard to how you want to manage your money in a 401k. So we'll take a look at a lot of history, and we'll take a look at a historical market performance, talk a lot about trading specifically. Now, I talk a lot about short-term trading in the class because I do so much of it, and students find it interesting. Again, I emphasize the orientation of the course, though, is toward longer-term investing, uh, right? So the real stuff I really want you to capture and get is the um, latter, but I do talk about moving in and out of the markets very quickly like I do. I'm trading uh, the British pound right now and uh, have a very large investment in the British pound, shorting the pound for the largest part. So that's the kind of thing where you can make or lose $10,000 in a single day. And uh, so I'll talk about that because it teaches you a lot about the long-term investing as well and also teaches you a lot about risk and how you avoid it or represent it. Then, of course, we go into the material that, for those of you who don't really care much about finance, but want to like get the basics out, mutual funds and retirement accounts, and module four, exchange-traded products and funds, ETFs and mutual funds. That's where most of you, probably every single person in this room, will have your liquid assets invested. So um, you need to know about you know what the options are. That can be a snake pit for you. There's a lot of uh, chicanery out there, a lot of product out there that's real junk, a lot of fee grabbing and so forth that you don't have to pay. And so we talk a lot about avoiding all of that. It's one of these deals where, I, of course, I'm a champion of free open source everything, right? I've been a member of the FOSS movement before the FOSS movement even existed, which is why all my stuff is free. I think people like you should, even though you can afford to buy anything you want, should actually be uh, concerned about paying anything for anything. You should try to get everything for free. And uh, so I'm going to try to tell you, you know, how you do that even in the area of uh, financial investing. You should insist on free books, free lectures, free everything. 
by the way, one of the ways that we can kind of elevate the rest of the world is to lower the cost of high-end, high-value education from what it is right now, right? I mean, that is obviously contributing to this implicit discrimination that I'm talking about. You're making, you know, a little bit more than you should make, and that's because there's so few of you. <laughs> and that's partly because it's so damn hard to get a decent STEM education at a reasonable cost in the United States. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's going to be some of the solution for the future that probably no one will employ. But you'll notice that at a personal level, I, uh, I live what I preach because my books are all free, uh, everything I offer is free, and I promote, so sell your, uh, get rid of your Mac OS, get rid of your Windows especially, of course, and, you know, walk the Linux line, it's time you do that. <laughs> drop everything else's, go the Linux route, and go everything connected with Linux route and so forth, and all of a sudden, everything's completely free. And uh, if you could sell your classmates back from high school on walking that line as well, then maybe their education will cost a lot less than yours does. Uh, so we get our first exam after module three, and then we continue the discussion of practical stuff with the uh, ATPs. Then we go to the world of bonds and notes and deals, yield-bearing financial assets, U.S. Treasuries, corporate bonds, zero-coupon bonds, mortgage-backed securities, money market assets. A pretty interesting world, actually. And it's where you're going to flee when you're trying to avoid risk. That's where we go when we're afraid of risk. We go to the world of bonds. So we'll talk about a portfolio approach to managing your financial assets where you shift your portfolio around given your attitude about risk and what you think is going on in the world and the like. So uh, we'll talk a lot, we'll get into that actually in the third week. And then we go to the wild, wildly leveraged world of futures contracts. So the uh, futures contracts that I was talking about in the pound is leveraged 100 to 1. Uh, and well, we actually more like 112 to 1 or something like that. So 1% rise or fall in that currency makes me a 100% or so gain or loss in the value of my investment. So if I invest $1,000 and the pound rises by 1%, I lose $1,000. So um, that's where you see the leverage stuff. But you'll find the futures contracts discussion interesting because it's pricing things for future delivery and it's very abstract theoretically, and I think a lot of you will simply like the abstraction. It's really interesting theory, and it's really valid theory. It's proven by the performance of the markets. Uh, the markets wouldn't perform well if it was all a bunch of nonsense, but those markets are very orderly, and they perform very well because the theory is just rock solid. So I think a lot of you will simply like that kind of theoretical application. And then we get to maybe the most important part of the class and also the easiest at the same time because it's about real estate. And boy, you don't have to have a high IQ or a master of science in quantum mechanics to figure out how real estate works. Real estate's pretty simple. It's really, 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 really simple. But you do have to know, you know, what you uh, want to do. And you mostly need to understand the market enough to where you commit at the right time to an investment. And there's one real reason for that, and that's because it's the leveraged investment. As I said, futures contracts are wildly leveraged, but that's because of the contract design. It's a financial contract. Real estate is leveraged because of how it's financed. It's because you borrow most of the purchase price on a loan that has a fixed rate of interest. And that gives you leverage on the purchase from an investment point of view. It gives you an absolute uh, minimum of five to one leverage. And given today's financial terms, more like 10 to one leverage. So that means if the house rises in value in one year by 5%, your rate of return on investment is 50%. That's how you get into the top, or stay in at least the top 10%. That's where the real money is made. And what's interesting, of course, you say, well, what do I have to do? Do I have to become like a real estate broker or house flipper like on HDTV? <laughs> no, you just be very careful about the house you buy in which you intend to live. And right there, it'll be the wisest investment you ever make from an investment point of view. Ask your parents, they'll tell you. 
will also, well, is there any way to lose money? There's a way to lose money on everything we talk about in this class. So you have to be circumspect when you buy in real estate. You have to kind of know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can buy at the wrong time or you can buy at the wrong place or under the wrong circumstances. So, you know, we look for red flags and say, whatever you do, you don't want to make that kind of purchase at the wrong time or you will experience the global trauma that we saw in 2008 and 2009 when about half of all real estate investors were driven to either bankruptcy or near bankruptcy because of the uh, chaos of the market at that time. If you're scared about things like that, that was so obviously going to happen in advance that anyone who's rational would know the market was going to collapse, you know, and yet it did anyway. Okay, we don't, we have just, I think, one homework assignment that's actually a long assignment that's early on, and that's an assignment where I ask you to build a little stock portfolio and tell me what it's going to be. This is to encourage you to look at quotations every day to see how you're doing mostly. And it's a competition. And so whoever wins the competition, I give a Ducky Shine 4 or similar mechanical keyboard to the winner. I did that last year. I've done it every, every semester. I'll, I'll bring in one of the keyboards. And Well, this is a... Uh, a Poker 3, a Vortec Poker 3, that's a very good keyboard, mechanical keyboard. In fact, that's what I gave away last uh, semester. It was a white with uh, backlit keycaps. So that's not a backlit keycap. So I give that, I offer that as an incentive to uh, encourage students to manage your portfolios. Whoever does the best gets a free $200 keyboard from me. And I pay for that out of my own pocket, by the way. The college doesn't pay for it. Um, so that homework assignment will be for you to choose your six or seven stocks so you can monitor them every day and look at how your portfolio is doing. All right. Now, the other stuff is all online, as you, most of you found it already or knew it was there. Now you know it's there. The general course calendar, which has all of our dates, and I've already been talking about it, is there. The, uh, the lecture slides, then, as you may have seen today, the lectures I give are posted before I give them. Sometimes a single lecture will cover more than one period in the classroom here, so a lecture for both um, Monday and Wednesday might pop up on Monday. The lectures are always there before the lecture is given. That's guaranteed. It's in PDF format, so you can, if you're the kind of person who uses your Linux computer to take notes uh, about the lecture, you can bring it to class or you can look at it later. And then uh, the book is the, uh, I'll talk about it on the next slide, so let's skip that until then. It's a free book that I wrote for you. It's, it's Creative Commons license, so uh, there's no royalties associated with it or anything. And uh, on, the, on the course calendar, you'll see all the reading assignments for this module, for example. So you want to look at that right away because I'm having you read chapter one and two of the book. Okay, and you want to get started on that. You can fall behind. The only thing that really matters is you're caught up by exam time, obviously. So, but you don't want to fall too far behind because I really give a lot of material. And, um, and it's a great way to kind of torpedo your prospects in this class is to fall behind on this. Okay. Now, the, re the book itself, that's kind of what the, the contact page looks like there. Um, You'll see it's 11 chapters, and you can't read that, but don't worry about it. You'll find it, and you can take a look at it. So I'm asking you to read chapter one. Now, this book is um, part of kind of a new approach to textbooks, and that is in this, if, if I were to assign a finance textbook to this class, as is typically done at other colleges, that book would cost you 250 bucks, maybe, really, you know, believe it or not. It's just outrageous what they charge for textbooks. Maybe I could find one for 125 or so. You know how what books cost. And it would be completely, utterly inadequate as a textbook for the reason that the production cycle for a paper book is simply too long to well represent a field that changes as rapidly as finance. The examples in it would be two years old, and they might as well be 100 years old if they're two years old. And so an online book has the advantage of having very current discussions and examples that in some cases happened last week and certainly not more than uh, six months ago or so. Some of the examples I have go back for years because they're such classic 
examples of some event, you know. So they'll, something that happened in 2011, but that's there because that was such an unusual event in 2011. The more typical stuff is um, three weeks old or four weeks old. And so the markets, their structure, the regulations changes practically daily. And so a dynamic book allows you to have that very current. Uh, and so the only way you can do a book like that is to be constantly revising it one chapter at a time. So I post chapter by chapter. So the book is not dated, the chapters are dated, right? And so I write, I conduct this class such that I um, post a chapter no more than a month before the lectures to be given about that subject. So uh, I don't have chapter four up yet because we're about a month away from that lecture. And so that'll pop up in about two weeks. And then the mutual fund chapter will pop up about two weeks before we have mutual funds. And so when I talk about the so-called river of money phenomenon in that chapter, I'll be using the most current data that exists for that in the book, let alone in the lecture. So that, of course, allows you to get very, very current material, and it's free. Now, the, the problem is that I don't have an editor, and so I'm often in a rush, so there's typos and whatever. Sometimes these chapters are kind of irritating uh, because I don't have somebody to act as editor to catch them. I try to get them out myself, but there, you know, every now and then you're going to stumble across a, mista a mistake. Now, the course does have a lot of jargon, and so, as I say in the course outline in some detail, uh, terms that are in red bold must be remembered because they'll be on the exam, typically in a matching question, okay? So you'll notice uh, there's a maybe an average of one red bold term on every page, and so that's a term that I'll ask you that you'll match to a definition or an example or something like that, okay? And that's to encourage you to, this is very jargon-based field, obviously, so you need to um, be encouraged to learn the jargon. So, as I say, homework assignments are detailed. The only one I think I'm going to give in a class this large is the, the giant one at the beginning where you, um, it's already been posted, where you have to go choose your portfolio. You'll find that kind of fun. And you kind of find it fun to see how your portfolio goes. Now, the little red down there means that some students finally told me I was using a different color. And they finally told me after years of using a different color that they're colorblind and they can't see the color. And nobody had ever told me that. So we did some colorblind research and found out that red 222-4538 can be seen by anyone who's colorblind. So I have that note down there to remind myself. You need to tell me this stuff, right? I can't see the bold red because uh, I'm colorblind. Like Ten years of colorblind students didn't tell me that. So um, tell me stuff like that. Um, that's why it, that's why it's not uh, purple or blue or whatever it used to be. Uh, if you want to get an A, and I'll give A's to probably 65 or so percent of you, uh, because I will get a distribution. I always do, right? I'm not going to give you all A's when some of you don't do very well. So I'll give it a. I end up giving A's to 60 percent this year. I'm going to raise it because of the size of this class, because with the with the class of this size comes problems. I cannot give you the detailed attention Harvey Mudd is famous for when I've got 210 of you, right? So uh, I compensate by that by just giving you higher grades. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, hope, hope you don't complain. But uh, the way to get an A and be on top of this is to simply organize yourself and your approach to my material. Because one thing I do for you that you'll see as um, an exercise of freedom is give you all this latitude to do anything you want anytime you want, right? I don't care if you don't come to lecture. I don't care when you look at the lecture. Uh, you know, all I care about is how you do on the exam. And so when you have that much of a temptation, some of you will screw up. You know, you'll fall so far behind, you won't be able to catch up. So don't let this freedom trip you up. Make sure that you organize your approach to this class in such a way that you don't fall behind. And I mean, you know, literally think of how you want to organize your approach. When do you want to do it? Now, I talked to students about the online, which will be posted. But the, the, it streams live, by the way, so you can watch it live right now. The archive of the live does not appear until tomorrow morning. 
because of the way YouTube works, they, they can't, you can't post up an archive on YouTube on a live stream immediately. So tomorrow you'll see a link there that is today's lecture. So you can't see the lecture until the following morning if, if you don't look at it live, which is fine. That means maybe you'll be watching it two weeks from now instead of uh, the day it was given. So I've talked to students a lot about how they do that. And what I'm commonly told is that students like to watch it at one and a half speed closed caption. And it's, everybody tells me that, one and a half speed closed caption. So I actually tailor my delivery such that it works very well at one and a half speed closed caption. <laughs> uh, that means, of course, you can get through an election that goes for an hour and 50 minutes in far less than an hour. This would be much better if I could teach this course three days a week for 45 minutes for the standard lecture. Because, you know, video stuff online kind of seems longish, you know, when it's an hour or so more. But I can't do that because of the way we schedule stuff at Harvey Mudd. So I wish we could, because then it would be basically reviewing 30-minute lectures, you know, at, with closed caption and the like. So if you stay on top of that, don't fall too far behind and organize yourself, you'll definitely get an A, uh, unless you have trouble with exams or have a problem with that, okay? Now, on that regard, unfortunately, maybe you'll think it's fortunate, actually. This is the first year in which I've ever been teaching, let alone teaching this class, let alone teaching at MUD, in which I do not give essay exams. Right? I've always given essay exams in Econ 104, but I can't even think about doing that in a class of this size. Now, as this class grew larger, because students, you know, like it to be large, so it means everybody can get in it, uh, but the, you have the freedom, of course, of uh, looking at the video, I have shifted the class over in the direction of online computerized exams. So for the last two years, I've been giving hybrid exams, about half essays and about half online mix of multiple choice and all that. This year, knowing that because of my uh, rumors about my retirement, the class would be huge, I either had to say to 50 people you can't take it, or I said I've got to go 100% now that I'm used to doing it to the online exam only, so no essay questions, all right? So I've also kind of worked out the wrinkles on how those kinds of online exams work because I've been using them in this class in Econ 104 for more than two years. Some problems, you know, that arise with that kind of exam, but I've, I've ironed most of that out. But the way it will work is because, you know, sometimes still you're a little uncomfortable with that kind of format. It's like taking your driver's license test at the DMV. <laughs> it's very similar. Right? So uh, uh, I'm going to be a little more liberal on the grades. Also, it is the case, I'll just I won't worry about it. It's very difficult to make up a large number of those kinds of questions without making a mistake on my end. Uh, and so there might be a question that was improperly worded or something. So don't worry about that if you encounter something that to you looks like it's that way. When I get the exams back, and if it's clear that that's a problem, I just remove that question and boost the grade for everyone. And I also have the habit of reestablishing the highest grade as 100%. So if I give an exam, and no, now in this class, that probably won't be a deal because this is a big class. But So if the highest score that anybody gets is 86 then that becomes 100, and I boost everybody's score by 14, okay? So the, the reason I say that is the moment you get your exam, you get your result back. The second you're done, right? So uh, you're, st oh, you're still here in the classroom, and people start, like, waxing and waning and screaming and yelling or cheering, whatever, because you're getting your exam score back right then. It's uh, As soon as you close the exam off, poof, you got 84%. <laughs> and uh, so... It's all relative because, again, it may be raised, and almost every case will be raised from what it is, so don't freak out on that, okay? Uh, those scores will be adjusted because of problems with the exam. Now, uh, now, in case so far this has not been clear, this course has zero attendance requirement. You absolutely do not need to come to class, nor will I hold it against you if you don't show up. What I will get is a little cult of people who will faithfully come and sit every single time. <laughs> About my little cults usually consist of 25 to 30 students. <laughs> They'll be here come hell or high water, and none of the rest of you will ever show up. That's the way it works. So uh, that's this course is designed to be run like that. It will be run like that. And again, I'm pointing out that this is uh, broadcast to YouTube. 
Prof. G.R. Evans is the channel. It's in a playlist called Econ 104. And uh, we'll stop with that. And when we come back on, um, let's see, this course is what's today? Today's Thursday, right? Today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday? Oh yeah, yeah, Monday. When we come back on Monday, we pick up right here where I stopped, okay? But we get through that pretty quickly, and we need to get into Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 right off the bat, okay? All right, we'll see you then.